Okay, so now that you have your anti-beta hydrogens all circled up for E2, we can start doing our mechanism now. So what's going to be the first step, right? Well, the, the most common mistake that people make is that they have the leaving group, chlorine, leave right away. So they do this. However, this is no good because if the chlorine takes the two electrons in the bond that, that's sharing with this carbon right here, then this carbon is going to lose electrons and become positive, right? And when carbon gets a positive charge, uh, gets a positive charge, then it's going to become a carbocation, which is very, very unstable. And you don't want your beaker blowing up in your face, so you don't want to do that first. Instead of doing this, just like in SN2, um, yeah, try and think back in SN2. What do we first do, right? And then another way to do to to figure out what happens first is look at what's most reactive or unstable in your beaker. You probably want to, what's, what's most natural is for the most reactive and unstable thing to react first and fix the unstableness of, it, of itself. Uh, so what's most unstable in our beaker is going to be terp-butoxide over here, right? Our strong, strong base. It has valence electrons over here, over here, over here, over here that make it very, very reactive. It has a negative charge. It wants to find something positive to make itself neutral. So what happens is you start your arrows from the base, and you attack this hydrogen over here that's anti, or you attack this hydrogen over here that's also anti. Okay. So now that your base has gotten a hydrogen, also known as a proton, right, to fix its charge, it's, it's going to be happy now. But when hydrogen, gets take, when hydrogen gets taken away, the electrons in the bond right here and right here, they're freed up. So where did they go, right? So where they go is right over here. The electrons migrate to the bond between your beta carbon and your alpha carbon. And the same is true for this hydrogen right here. Well, the same is true for this bond over here. Okay? And then when you do this, right, you're going to form a double bond over here or a double bond over here. So now you have to count the number of bonds your carbon has. So carbon has one bond, two bond, three bond, four bonds right now. And it's getting a fifth bond from over here or over here. So that fifth bond is going to overload that carbon with too many electrons. Carbon only wants four bonds because that's what keeps it nice and neutral. So when it's getting a fifth bond, it's going to want to throw away a bond. So what, what does it throw away? The easiest bond that it can throw away is right here between the carbon and the chlorine because the chlorine is super electronegative, so it's already grabbing all those electrons. The electrons in the bond, instead of being in the middle right here, it's actually already basically over here. So it's, very, it's really easy to just give up this bond. And it kicks off, what you do is um, the movement of electrons to form the double bond, it kicks out your chlorine. So now chlorine's out of the picture. Uh, so you get chlorine over here chlorine over here, right? All right, so this is now how chlorine looks like, all right? Is anything weird about it? Well, it's missing a negative charge because it just got electrons in this step right here, all right? Okay, so now that uh, you guys saw the mechanism for E2, uh, it, sh it should be a lot more clear why it's better if you do it with the anti-hydrogen. Because let's say if we did it with a synhydrogen, right? This hydrogen, so what I did over here is I took our molecule and I turned it sideways, okay? And I took out a lot of the unnecessary atoms just to show you why a syn hydrogen is bad for E2 or it's not as stable. So let's say if you went to grab this hydrogen over here, right? It's beta, but it's not anti. So it's facing the same side as your chlorine. So that's this hydrogen over here, right? They're nice and close to each other. And let's say if your base comes in and tries to grab, whoop, tries to grab this hydrogen over here, and then the hydrogen's bonds migrate over here to form a double bond, just like we did over here. If you do that, then this carbon is going to be overloaded to any bonds, so he's going to give up this chlorine um, leaving group. But the chlorine is going to get a negative charge soon, and the terp-butoxide it's full of elect it has plenty of electrons. So electrons, electrons are the same charge; they're both negative. So negative, uh, negative and negative repel each other because like charges repel, it's kind of like a magnet. The positive pole of a magnet is going to rep repel the positive pole of the other magnet, so it's going to repel. The same thing is going on here. This repelling force is not going to be very favorable for your reaction to occur. Your base is trying to come in and grab your hydrogen, but 
it's being kind of repelled away by the leaving group here. And your leaving group is trying to leave, right? But it's being repelled back in by your base here. So that's bad. So usually you don't like, you don't want sin re um, elimination. It's not very fast, it's not very stable. You like anti, because if you, if you do anti, right, you can grab the base, that's fine. Uh, sorry, you don't grab the base. Your base grabs your hydrogen, and then the bond right here, right, migrates over, just like over here. This hydrogen here that's anti is this one right here. So the bond moves over, you overload your carbon with too many bonds, you kick out the leaving group and then you get your chlorine molecule over here, okay? So now you guys can see your products for the E2 mechanism. All right, so the first one here, let's say we attack this hydrogen, then we're gonna form a double bond right over here, okay? And then over here, let's say if we decided, let's say if the base ended up grabbing this hydrogen first, then the bond is going to form right over here, and the chlorine is gone, okay? So that's your two products for the E2 reaction. So, and then you're also gonna get a chlorine minus and let's see, what else? And a, your tert butoxide, that's this molecule over here, becomes tert butanol because it grabbed the hydrogen. So now there's a hydrogen over here. And also it gave up electrons, right? What these arrows are saying is that the electrons are migrating over uh, the tert butoxide's sharing electrons to form a bond and then your molecule is basically losing electrons. So it loses that negative charge and becomes neutral and good, okay? All right, so that's E2. And if you take a look, uh, this was just all done in one step, just like SN2, right? And you also started with your nucleophile here, just like SN2, but the only difference is that your nucleophile doesn't act like a nucleophile, it acts like a base. All right, so hopefully E2 uh, mechanism is uh, a little better now for you guys. Uh, next, we're going to take a look at E1, and I'm going to show you guys why E1, you, it doesn't matter if you, you're reacting with a syn hydrogen or anti-hydrogen, all right? So uh, let's see, first, just to recap, for E2, make sure first you draw your beta hydrogens, and that's the case for E1 as well, but the, the thing with E2 is that you need to circle your anti-beta hydrogens, unless if your professor says it, it's okay to do a syn, hydro, a syn hydrogen elimination, okay? Just so just uh, give me a second and we're gonna do the, we're gonna do the E1 mech. 